Welcome everyone to our Wednesday evening Bible study for June the 2nd. We are glad that you are here. Thank you for joining us. This is being filmed uh, a week ahead of time, so I don't have um, updates on prayer concerns, but certainly invite you to pray for those uh, concerns that you are aware of uh, as we come before the Lord together. We're going to finish the second chapter of Acts tonight, which we looked at uh, the most of the second chapter last week, and we'll, we might get into a little bit of chapter three. So let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for our study through the book of Acts. We pray that you would open our hearts to hear what you would say to us tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to continue to pray for Vacation Bible School, which is, which is upcoming, and for the Alaska mission trip, uh, June 18th through the 26th. We're very excited about this trip, asking God to do great and wonderful things in and through us uh, through this time together. Last week, we talked about the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples, uh, giving, them, giving them the ability to preach and speak in languages that they did not know. Uh, and there were multiple nationalities in the crowd that day, Jewish, uh, faithful Jewish pilgrims there from all over the Mediterranean world for the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, they, they speak in these different languages, the crowds are amazed and perplexed. Peter stands up and explains what's happening, uh, appeals to the prophet Joel and appeals to David, gives a summary of the gospel. And uh, by the end of the sermon, the crowds are hooked and they ask, what then shall we do? Peter says, let me tell you. And he says, repent and be baptized uh, for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit as well. And verse 40 tells us, verse 41 tells us that 3,000 people respond. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse, uh, earlier in Acts chapter 1, um, uh, Luke has told us that there are about 120 uh, believers that are gathered together uh, in Jerusalem waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Uh, within 24 hours, that 120 moves to 3,120, and it's an amazing thing. And then Acts chapter 2 verse 42 through verse, verse 47 through the end of the chapter gives us a little glimpse of those initial days uh, after the day of Pentecost, here's what those 3,120 or so were doing uh, immediately following this miraculous day. So picking up at verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching uh, uh, and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So four things in that verse that they're doing, uh, not necessarily centered, it seems to me this is centered on a daily basis, not specifically talking about worship uh, uh, on the Sabbath day. So they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles, uh, the 11 plus one, now 12, Matthias, are constantly, you know, you move from 120 who've been with Jesus for a long time to 3,120. Those 3,000, they've got a lot of catching up to do. And so the apostles are constantly teaching them, talking with them about who Jesus is, all that Jesus did and said. Uh, we've talked about this multiple times over the last couple of months that this was an oral culture and you sit around and you tell stories all the time of, of what you've experienced. So they're telling the stories of Jesus and they're teaching, they're interpreting the message of Jesus, all that this means constantly. And the people, the 3000 plus, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to just being together, to enjoying each other's company. These 3,000 um, have, you know, they don't know everybody. They've got a lot uh, of getting to know each other to do. They don't have uh, lots of shared history together. They've been, uh, uh, their lives have been disrupted and captured and, and blessed by God in this miraculous way. So they need to spend that time, a lot of time in fellowship. The breaking of bread, which, uh, as we'll see in just a moment, speaks to normal meals, normal fellowship meals, but also, it seems to me, speaks of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Lord's Supper being a central part of their gathering together as they're getting to know what it, each other and getting to know what it means to follow Jesus. They need this very frequent reminders of the, the death and resurrection of Jesus that we find in the communion. It's also a reminder, I think, that every time we share communion, every time we come to the table, the Lord's table together, it's not just about our own personal remembrance of Jesus. We're doing this together. It's a family meal that speaks to the fellowship 
fellowship that we have, the oneness that we have as sisters and brothers in Christ, and the prayers. So they're praying all the time. The prayers also reflect the Jewish prayer schedule, daily prayer schedule in the temple, which we'll see as we move through uh, the book of Acts. But there is this, this hunger for prayer, hunger for prayer together. Four things in verse 42 that they do, that they devote themselves to, not just dabble in these things, but they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Not surprisingly, verse 43, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. They're walking closely with God. They've been in prayer for a long time. Uh, they're continuing to stay in prayer. They're continuing in this spiritual rhythm. They've just received the Holy Spirit in a powerful way, and the Spirit continues to do signs and wonders among them, and there is a sense of awe that develops. Uh, which makes us think of worship. One of the things that we do in worship is express our awe, our praise. We marvel at God. We offer our, our, our praise and our, our thanksgiving, our gratitude to God in worship. Verse uh, 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 45, they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Uh, they were generous, they were sacrificial, they took care of each other, and they made financial sacrifices in order to bless others. They did not hold on to their possessions, but they gave their possessions away, or they sold their possessions and gave the proceeds for the common good. Now, this is beyond, they're all already tithers, most likely, if they're faithful Israelites. So this is, this is beyond the tithe. This is, this is a, a way of saying, all to Jesus I surrender. And, and they, were, they were moving towards that all to Jesus, I surrender. Now, it was a different setting. It was, it was a, it, it, it's this amazing moment, birth of the church moment, uh, which doesn't mean that all of us have to literally follow this passage, although we, I believe, must be open always to the possibility that the Spirit uh, does, uh, on occasion, call some of us to do just exactly what uh, the disciples, the early church is doing in this moment. But the point for us is that sense of generosity, that sense of sacrifice, even beyond the tithe, to care for the needs of those in the church. Now, in our day, the church is larger. The family of Christ is larger. It's worldwide. We have sisters and brothers all over the world, and our care for the body of Christ, uh, physical needs, uh, works through uh, our giving to people in places far from here. We're in the middle of the one great uh, hour of sharing offering, which is a specific offering that our American Baptist churches participate in, that the money is used to meet physical needs all around the world. And, and we, as we give sacrificially to that offering, we're, we're living out what the disciples are doing here. Day by day, verse 44, excuse me, 46, uh, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Again, worship in the temple, uh, prayer schedule in the temple, uh, and then breaking bread together, this fellowship, this generosity. They hunger to be together. One of the hardest parts, as we've said often about the pandemic, about the last year, is that we've been unable to be physically together the way that we would like. We're beginning to be able to return to that uh, more normal physical schedule, and it's a beautiful thing. It's what we're called to do, to be together, to pray and to break bread. Verse 47, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Um, the evangelism flows out of the normal rhythm of life, of devoting, de devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to the prayers and to worship and to generosity. In doing all of these things, they're generating goodwill. They're blessing people. They're blessing their neighbors, and their neighbors take notice. And the Lord uses this lifestyle, uses the way they are, the way they live, to bring people to faith, which begs the question for us, the way that we live as a congregation, the way that we live as individuals in our community, do we live in such a way that God can work through our living to draw people 
into the church to draw people to faith in Jesus. Uh, it happened then, it can happen now. For us to live with such faithfulness and generosity and love that people ask, uh, what does this mean? And we are able to share with them, this is what it looks like when people love and follow Jesus together. So this is at the end of chapter two is a summary of life in the early church, just a snapshot. And then as we move into chapter three, and we'll look at the first part of this chapter, the first 10 verses tonight, as we move into chapter three, we begin to see some specific details of things that the spirit does through the disciples. Chapter three, verse one, one day Peter and John we're going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. Again, following the, the, the prayer schedule that, that, the temple, uh, that the temple had. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. Lame from birth. So he is, uh, has a disability that prevents him from provide, providing for himself. At least he has friends, someone, maybe it's family members, who put him in place as people enter the temple for the prayers so that he can ask for help, for money. Uh, his life is dependent upon the generosity of others. And Peter and John are going into the temple to pray, and they see this man right there. Verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, actually the man sees them first. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Uh, he asked them for money. He asks them for help. Peter looked intently at him, uh, as did John, and said, look at us. Look at us. Look at us. Um, that's a powerful personal connection there. Uh, instead of just tossing some coins into the bucket, they say, look at us, human to human, person to person. Let me, as an aside, uh, through lots of uh, growth and learning and mistakes and successes and failures over a long period, uh, 25 plus years of being a pastor, I, I'm now at a place where when people ask me for money on the street or when people come by the church asking for money, I do not, uh, most of the time, do not give, give them what they ask. Um, <clears throat> just, just a, it's just a personal practice of mine based on an awareness that uh, I've come to believe that more often than not, the giving of money, just handing out money, actually hurts in the long run more than it helps. Now, if, if a person is belligerent and I, you know, I feel and I, I want to remove myself from the situation, sometimes just giving a little bit of money can help you get out of the situation. But, but if it's not that situation, if it's not that kind of situation, it's not something that I, that I do usually. But what I do try to do is look people in the eye. Look people in the eye and say, I will pray for you. Tell me your name and I will pray for you. Uh, sometimes people will do that. Sometimes, most of the time, people just walk away. But but, but there is something about looking people in the eye that is very significant and very powerful. Again, if you feel, um, you know, there are certain situations where it's probably not safe to do that. Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a man, a male, I'm pretty tall, um, in decent shape. So most of the time I'm, I'm a, in a little bit safer position. So, so I, can, I can do that. But, but it's important to note here that, um, uh, that Peter and John say, look at us. Look at us. This is human to human contact. All right. Uh, verse five. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Verse six. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. Stand. He gives them something far better than money. He gives them, he gives, he heals them. He, he gives him, the, he's never been able to walk. He's been lame since birth. He gives him something he's never had before. He gives him the ability to walk. Uh, can't leave this verse without saying, uh, I don't know who first said this, but lots of people have said this over the years. That when the apostles were, the first apostles, Peter and John were around, they didn't have any gold. The early church didn't have any gold to give but they had the power to help you walk again. Uh, now the church has plenty of money, plenty of gold, 
but we don't have much spiritual power. Um, something just to think about. Verse 7, And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. There's the speaking of healing, and then there's the physical touch to, to complete the healing. Jumping up, verse 8, how excited this man must have been. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Signs and wonders that the Spirit is doing through the apostles, through the early church. All the people, verse 9, saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So the purpose of the miracle is, is not just to bless uh, one individual, as, as beautiful as that is, but it is also to, um, to point people to what God is doing through the Holy Spirit uh, amongst these followers of Jesus. The people are amazed. Um, they're filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to, to him. There are witnesses here. What God is doing is uh, doing great things uh, through the early church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, we don't typically uh, heal people and uh, just through the Spirit and enable them to walk. The signs and wonders in our day, or at least in our context, are usually different. But those signs and wonders through the Spirit are still real. Those signs and wonders that happen when we practice generosity and love and as we look people in the eye and as we pray for them and as we bless each other and as we serve, when we do these things, these can be signs and wonders through the Spirit where God does great things and people are drawn to faith in Jesus as we interpret for them what's going on, as we tell them the stories of Jesus. I'll close with uh, uh, repeating our five vision statements and expressing my belief that as we open ourselves to the Spirit and allow the Spirit to, uh, to put flesh on these vision statements as we embody them, then these really do become signs and wonders. And, and the work of God is done in our community and, and people come to believe in Jesus and the kingdom is furthered. So our vision statements. Um, we help each other become more like Jesus. We love each other unconditionally. We worship God wholeheartedly. We help people meet Jesus. We love our hurting world. In the power of the Spirit, if we seek to do these things, they will become signs and wonders that God uses to do great things. May it be so for our life together as a church. So we'll end here at uh, verse 10. Next week, we'll pick up uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 11. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, for your word and for the example of the early church and all that you did among them in those early days. We pray that by our life together, we may so love you and love one another and open ourselves to the Spirit that you would perform signs and wonders through us by the way we serve and worship and love and witness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. Good night.